Thanks for joining us. Uh, I'm Nick Lace, my partner Claire Augry. We're from Unknown Studio. We're the landscape architecture design team leading the uh, Druid Lake Vision Plan. Um, this is our second community meeting. Um, so thank you on behalf of the uh, Department of Recreation and Parks for joining us today. Um, today we are going to give you a little bit of an overview, introduction to us, our project. Um, some of you uh, joined us back in April for the first community meeting. We're gonna take you through some of our initial project principles. We're gonna review some of the feedback we've received so far, so what we've heard from you so far, and we're gonna take you into our design frameworks. Schedule-wise, we're about halfway through this project. Uh, you can see here circled in red in the middle, um, We've got another meeting with you all in September, and we also have uh, several other sessions with uh, community groups um, throughout this project. Our team, um, our client group is from Recreation and Parks under Director Moore. We are the landscape architecture team. We're working together with a civil engineer, um, Aceto, you're gonna hear from Odessa shortly, uh, who is our public outreach consultant. We're working with Tool Design, their transportation and engineering team, who's helping us interface with the Druid Park Lake Drive uh, project just immediately south of our project. And we're working with Biohabitats, who's helping us uh, take on the task of turning this drinking water reservoir into a living, uh, living lake and ecosystem. Some of the feedback we received uh, so far is, has been through our public open houses um, and uh, We've got a lot of stakeholders involved in this project. So you all residents and neighbors, we also have community groups. We're working with some nonprofit groups. We've got uh, on the technical side, we're working with an interagency group. So to make sure that we uh, come up with a feasible buildable solution where we have some groups within recreation and parks and executive committee, as well as a, a youth advisory group. So we're, we're taking a lot of input to develop the designs in this project. Um, just to re, sort of uh, restate what, what a vision plan is. Um, this is a, it's a complex project today. It has a lot of uh, existing um, projects. The, the tanks project, which um, I'm sure many of you are familiar with on the west end of the lake, that is what has enabled this transformation of the rest of the lake into a recreational and ecological, um, going from what's a, a sort of uh, sterile um, uh, chlorinated drinking or chlorinated drinking water reservoir into a living lake that has access. There's a lot. There's a lot of complexity around the lake. Um, Drew Park Lake Drive. Um, some of you have seen that the uh, the Big Drop project, uh, the construction of some of the infrastructure for the tanks. Um, all around the project, there's a lot of complexity. So we're taking and synthesizing all of this and coming up with a vision for the future lake. This is the first step in that planning process. So some of the considerations, this is just a, a kind of a teaser draft example of what the vision plan could look like. Um, it, will, it will be shaped by your input. Um, so we're gonna be considering what the public priorities are. So um, listening from you, um, we're gonna be looking at sort of the history and cultural significance of the landscape and park itself, the neighborhoods around the park. We're going to be considering some of the more nuts and bolts um, aspects of the project, per permitting, implementation, um, the, the budget, and how we're going to fundraise for a really ambitious project like this. And we're going to be looking for long-term partners as well um, who could help uh, recreation and parks realize this and maintain this over time. We're also going to be looking at how the project is phased um, in the event that it's not just built in one phase, but it, it evolves over time. So what we need from you, um, today we really love your thoughts on our initial three framework directions. We want to know what design features and programs you like, what did we miss, and uh, what some of our first project priorities should be. And lastly, we want to know how we can reach additional community members um, who, are, uh, who could use and appreciate this project. All right, great. So I'm Claire Augury. I work here with Nick um, at Unknown Studio, one of the co-founders, and we're thrilled to work on this with all of you. 
Uh, but just wanted to lay out a few principles of the project about how we think about this. How do we, how do we get started? The first one is really to go big. We're really living in a really interesting time in terms of big infrastructural ambition. And we know that that's already occurring with the tanks. Um, and we think that's an important principle for how we consider this lake. Um, we also want to be very proactive as we think about community programming. As Nick mentioned, we want to transform what is a sterile potable reservoir into an ecological interconnected and recreational amenity. And then last but certainly not least is really thinking about restorative justice for an area which has been segregated uh, from its neighborhoods and from the connective tissue of the city. So just to speak a little bit more about those four principles, um, most of you know this, I'm sure, but Druid Hill Park is one of the oldest parks in the country. It's actually the third of the major parks after Fairmount and Central Park in New York City. It's one of the largest, it's one of the most storied and beautiful. And this piece of the park, 100, over 100 acres on the southern end, needs to really live up to that legacy um, of this being one of the most important landscapes in the history of the United States. We also really believe in proactive and inclusive programming. So we're not gonna develop a build it and they will come model. We're working very actively with Rec and Parks to talk about how do we proactively build programs in that are gonna allow all comers to use the lake, um, try new programs, learn new skills, have educational opportunities, recreational opportunities, um, and lots of flexibility and choice. The third one, as Nick mentioned, really to think about how do we reinvent a lake which is currently fenced off, as you know, with nothing living in it, into something that is um, not only has a, a loop that you can run around, but actually get into and have it be an ecological place, possibly a place to go fishing, swimming, boating, etc. And then last but not least, uh, we'll just show these wordles for a second. No matter what question we ask on this project, or really any other project in Baltimore, we're almost getting the same answer throughout. It's about access. It's about restorative justice and it's about safety. So starting to think about putting our roads on road diets and reconnecting neighborhoods and communities that have been severed from the park. Uh, and that is a hugely important part of this process. So we're gonna hand it over to Odessa Phillip from Aceto Consulting. Thank you so much, Claire and Nick. Welcome uh, everyone to this meeting. Uh, super excited to be back, uh, to be sharing with you what we heard from the first meeting. Uh, as Nick and Claire mentioned, during that meeting, um, we were soliciting feedback. It's super important to us that we are getting that from each and every one of you. So let's talk a little bit about what we were asking and how we were asking for that information. We used SurveyMonkey as a tool, as, as well as another program called Mural to solicit some feedback. One of the most important things I believe in that soliciting feedback is that we had it in kind of a couple of different groups. So you'll see at the bottom of this graph that SurveyMonkey 1 and SurveyMonkey 2 are separated out. SurveyMonkey 1 was anyone who participated during the actual meeting and SurveyMonkey 2 were people who participated in the extended comment period. One of the things we talked about was preferred programming and the best ways in which we can um, solicit uh, feedback on what people want to do. You heard Claire just mention um, wanting people to actually use the lake and not just uh, be around it. So some of the things that we heard and th that we heard strongly was that ecological planting, shade trees, a place for you to be able to go and actually interact and engage with the project, and water activities, being able to actually get into the facility. Those were strong pieces in terms of preferred programming. When we think about how people would want to see the use of the lake in the future, uh, what you heard most, what we heard most was that gathering spaces is incredibly important. But also what I think is key is that people see the lake and Druid Hill Park as a place that they would want to be all day. And that's evident by the, uh, the use or the, the uh, acknowledgement of food and beverage and lake swimming. Um, also, some of the activities that people are doing there today, biking, outdoor exercising, um, but one of the most important is fishing, right? And again, starting to interact with the lake and get in that water as opposed to just uh, something that we're looking at. Another piece that we talked about was educational programming and how we could, um, as Claire just mentioned, really program into the space was something that we saw as really important. 
So when we talked about educational programming, uh, what we heard was that environmental education was really important from the people who participated, um, followed very closely by voting and cultural performance. Um, what you will notice is that uh, in, in the fourth category, cultural history, people who actually attended the event uh, felt stronger about cultural history than performance, and that's really indicated. But then the people who participated following the event were the ones that were really dictating uh, what, how that actually turned out. Um, so the word clouds were really uh, allowed us to pull kind of information during both the mural activity and Survey Monkey, and really look for thematic pieces um, and what people thought was missing. So uh, what, we, what you see in the largest level letters is what is super important for us. The largest lettering was like concerts and kayaking and boating. Um, again, getting into the water and actually uh, being an active part of it. You see paddle boating is also there a couple of different times. But habitat restoration um, and restoring the habitat, uh, lake swimming, those were still really key elements that we noted. And then finally, uh, when we talked about elements and features that are of importance to everyone, um, what you see the most, the strongest, is improved accessibility. People want to be able to walk, bike, uh, take transit, also be able to drive. They want to feel like they're connected and that the park is not just a location that is outside of them, but something that they have access to. Um, there are also some security and comfort pieces in lighting and restrooms that we see there and people wanting to understand the significance of the history. So those are really important and we see that. Again, um, I think this is you, Claire. Uh, unmute myself. Thanks, Odessa. Um, so that's a great segue into community programming. So we're starting to lay out what some of these programs might actually look like on the site, and Nick's going to take us deeper into that. Um, but first, just so let's talk a little bit about footprints and precedents. We're not the only artificial lake. Is actually a great tradition in park making of converting reservoirs and creating um, creating impounded wetlands and, and lakes and. Um, we see those here um, for scale, Shelby Farms in Memphis, Prospect Park in Brooklyn, Silver Lake Reservoir in Los Angeles, and just some of the programs that are typically seen, boating, habitat, cafe, places to eat and dine or have an event, um, boat launches, bridges, overlooks. So we really put all of these on the table. Um, started just looking just very schematically on how these might fit. What would it mean to be able to do some of these activities in Druid Lake? Um, so swimming is a big one that we've heard a lot of uh, favorable um, comments on, and it's a really wonderful program. You can see here on the left the scale of an Olympic-sized swimming pool. If we were just to integrate lap swimming, surely we would want flexibility and choice, so a shallow end, a chance for swim skills and for folks to learn how to swim. And then also you can see the 200 or 500 meter length here that's indicative of if we're going to have a sprint triathlon these are all things that could happen simultaneously depending on the design of the lake boating uh, important important conversations around boating are you uh, renting a boat are you able to launch your own boat are there custom boats are they manned for you are you paddling yourself so we're looking at all of those options um, but considering a few different locations where you could launch a kayak or a canoe or even have dragon boat racing or kind of specialty boating like we see down at the inner harbor Food service, this is of course the great convener to bring people together. We've heard a lot of positive responses to this, the idea of being able to get an ice cream or have a lunch on the lake uh, and look at those great views. I think if we do nothing else, we have to restore the loop around the lake. That's a must, must do. And that gives us an opportunity to have cycling, running and walking. It's about a mile and a half around. And we'll be thinking very carefully about how we delineate where are the fast lanes, where are the slow lanes, making sure that folks who are gonna come and do their laps like they do at the other reservoirs are able to do that. And we can also have the little ones and slower, slower walkers uh, utilizing the space. Arts and performance, this is just so, so of Baltimore, but the idea of making sure that we bring in some of the wonderful arts community into the process and finding places for not only temporary and events-based arts, but also permanent pieces. So laying those all together, when Nick walks you through the frameworks next, we're gonna see how these might start to have adjacencies or be closer or further from each other um, and how they might sit within the future vision of Druid Lake. Okay, over to you. Great. 
So we're going to dive in here into our initial frameworks. Um, these are very much drafts. These are still very sketchy. They all rely on different landscape concepts to create a kind of holistic interface between the lake and the rest of the park. Um, so we're kind of drawing from a lot of things we've seen in history, the natural features that, that existed historically, as well as introducing some, some newer ideas um, for creating a, a new kind of lake um, that, that has uh, places for people and ecology to come together. The first one really harkens back to the picturesque legacy of the park, and this is sort of mid 19th century, very early, one of the earliest parks um, that uh, took a lot of cues from the picturesque. It's very much a forest park, uh, so it was um, intentionally planted with a lot of oak trees and uh, had, um, was very much defined by forest, um, particularly on the northern edge of the park with these kind of fingers of groves and forests coming um, with clearings which were originally created by sheep and uh, great meadows. So many of you know the mansion lawn and many of the sort of iconic images in the park of these long landscapes. So we've tried to accentuate those and bring back some of that to uh, the lakefront, which is um, because the, the west end of the lake has been kind of, uh, has been removed for the tanks and created, um, turned into land, we're trying to bring back some of the meandering shoreline of this um, through, through this scheme. So um, here you very much see these, these, these uh, kind of traditional long views with rolling topography and sort of framing of things beyond that would have been kind of traditional with the picturesque and, and uh, in, in alignment with some of the original early designs for the park. Um, we've also tried to give the, bring back some of the meander of the lake's edge. So pushing and pulling the north and southern shorelines, creating these kind of overlook moments, putting some program out on those uh, on the northern shore. Um, this outdoor education building and boat launch becomes one of those as well as an overlook plaza, sort of getting you out um, uh, 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 below Druid Park Lake Drive. Um, in, um, in some of the woodland areas, there would be stormwater features to accommodate some of the um, stormwater that needs to be designed around, around the tanks. And we'd also here have uh, one of the features we're, we're looking for your feedback on is the idea of a mid-lake crossing, um, kind of cutting the, the lake into sort of two, um, into two uh, eastern and western halves, but also getting you a, a sort of quick access from around Linden Avenue towards uh, the tennis courts and aquatic, uh, aquatic center. Um, from a circulation standpoint, one of, one of the things we're really excited by this scheme is um, sort of being able to meander a bit as you're making your way around the, the dark red line here, which is the Jones Falls Trail promenade. promenade. Um, and this gets you very close to uh, the, the Swan um, Madison Gateway, Swan Drive Madison Gateway, as, as well as Utah. So having these uh, uh, really strong bike connections to the south across Druid Park Lake Drive. We're also um, looking to get connections, future connections, uh, probably longer uh, with some roadway changes to uh, near Mount Royal Terrace, as well as to East Drive here up to the north. Um, and as mentioned, the, there's this mid-lake crossing um, option that's shown in this scheme. From a program standpoint, we're really looking to sort of build on some of the active programs, the aquatic center, uh, the pool that's being refurbished right now, reinvented, as well as the tennis courts, basketball courts that are that are above the northeastern side of the lake. So giving a new boathouse and outdoor education building here. Um, and then with a new program, which would be sort of seen across the northern, what what is the, the, uh, the meadow uh, um, or lawn across the northern tank. So these long axial views and a swimming area associated with a cafe. Uh, we're, we're keeping a amphitheater here on the western shore overlooking the southern, the southern tank overlooking the lake. Um, here are some views of kind of what this looks like. These are, these, these, uh, are still um, very early drafts, uh, but give a little bit of a look and feel of the, the way that the, um, the forest 
um, groves and clearings would help define this landscape and some of the circulation features. So again, the, the cafe and swimming area here up on the northwest corner, amphitheater, and then another program cluster uh, closer to the aquatic center, tennis courts, and some of the really active moments in the park with this mid lake crossing um, bringing you back to this overlook around Linden. Um, here's a view looking from the west to the east, um, sort of across the, the, the Great Lawns and with some of these frame views across the lake. And again, with those overlook moments uh, at Linden and um, near this, uh, the boathouse um, on the northern shore. All right, uh, second concept really uh, ties into the, the, the historic um, fact that this lake was uh, put in its location because it used to be connected to a stream valley. There were um, probably 20 to 30 springs throughout Druid Lake, um, sorry, Druid Hill Park that fed um, various, well, they, they became features uh, for visitors, as you can see in this historic lithograph, uh, where visitors to the park could fill up their water bottles. Um, many residents around the city relied on this, kind of, this clean drinking water um, for, for many decades. Um, so, and it's one of the reasons that the, the lake was originally located where it is. It, it was in this deep ravine, which was fed by numerous springs. So in this plan, we're trying to bring back some of those streams and we're actually proposing a, a, a full uh, creek restoration that would lead up towards the boat lake. Um, many of you who've been through the existing Jones Falls trails um, have probably experienced some of the wet, the sort of flooded wetland areas that the, the path um, crosses through. Our, our uh, um, goal here would be to really uh, to really develop a complete stream restoration, which, which brings that back and brings back some of the ecological function and allowing that ecological function to support the lake um, from a sort of oxid oxid oxidization standpoint, aeration, and just the overall health of the lake. Um, we're looking at a couple other features, this uh, having a stream that would go between the tanks and having a, a sort of woodland um, feature that would go on the southern edge of, uh, um, on the this sort of southern valley feeding into the lake. And all of these create on the western shore of the lake, this sort of rich creekside uh, ecology and experience. And uh, you'll see here this habitat meadow and, and a few of the views. Um, kind of sandwiched in between these stream valleys as a way of really um, sort of doubling down on all the biodiversity that, that could come out of this scheme. Um, we are, from a circulation standpoint, proposing that to really play off that, that we bring the circulation up to the Northwest and, and really uh, allow the circulation around the lake to bring you into this rich biodiverse landscape. So going around the lake, you have a chance to go into um, and be immersed with an ecological and forested landscape. Um, we are also proposing there's connections down to Madison, Utah. These are a little bit further away from the primary loop. And we're also looking for connections up to East Drive and down to Mount, Mount Royal. Um, we've got a, a fishing pier located on the southern end of the lake to kind of get you out over the water. Um, here, looking at the program, with this scheme, we're concentrating more of the program a bit further to the west in this cove at the end of Red Road. So the boat launch, the cafe, and boathouse um, would would be sort of overlooking this um, overlooking this grove and um, cove out onto the lake, a bit higher up, closer to the drive. Um, we're looking to expand the amphitheater in this, so opening it up to larger events. Um, and uh, we're also looking to reorient it a bit so that it's pointing more uh, due east across the long views of the lake. Here's some 3D views of that from above. Here you can really see that the meadow and the, the stream valleys on the west end of the lake, um, sort of creating this, this really wonderful ecological, ecologically rich moment in the western corner of the lake. And then some of the program that serves that up in the cove, the boathouse, the cafe, the swimming area on the northern shore. 
This is a view uh, from the Northwest looking across the lake. Um, again, seeing those stream valleys and uh, uh, this uh, wild, wild, wild life meadow um, sandwiched between the two. And last but not least, our third scheme, which we've, we're, we're calling Perched Wetlands and Islands, really tries to reimagine what the, what the lake would have looked like if it wasn't initially designed as a drinking water reservoir. Um, the uh, original landscape designer, Howard Daniels, designed uh, the Druid Lake with a civil engineer, and it was very much designed to, um, to provide drinking water for the citizens of Baltimore. And we tried to take some of the, some of the logic and, and the sort of romance that he used in the boat lake and um, reconsider what the western shore of the lake would look like. Um, bringing back some of the meandering and sort of curvilinear lines of, of, of the lake edge as well as views across the lake. So our scheme here introduces a couple of things. We've got uh, new islands in the lake, which we think we can build by sort of uh, cutting soil within the lake potentially. We're also introducing a series of what, uh, what we're calling perched wetlands. These are um, pools that uh, have aquatic habitat in them. There could be cascades between them. Um, so it's a string of these pools that's above the lake and cascades down to the lake. Um, this introduces uh, a novel kind of ecosystem, something that we know works working with our partners at Biohabitats. Um, it also provides some interesting areas around the lake um, for people to uh, swim and boat here on the northwest shore. We've introduced a swimming, a swimming area that's a little bit more protected from the open, openness of the lake, as well as it buffers from the southern uh, Druid Park Lake Drive and some of the traffic and uh, edges on, on the south. From a circulation standpoint here, we're, we're sort of bending the, um, the promenade towards the south, connecting more towards the Madison and Utah, um, those strong bicycle connections, um, bringing you through the forested landscapes in the south and out over the islands, which we think would be really interesting um, aspect of the circulation here. So from a programming standpoint, we're really looking a little bit more of kind of sprinkling that program along the northern shore. So um, with the boat, boat launch and outdoor education building um, uh, just south of the basketball and tennis courts, and then a boathouse cafe and swimming area just west of that. Um, and then uh, an amphitheater here um, with this really wonderful view beyond kind of through the islands. So. Here's another 3D view of what this looks like from the south. Um, again, those, those islands and this sort of cove uh, with the cafe and boathouse and some of these forested perched wetland features um, that extend to the west. And uh, a fishing pier here located at the end of Linden. Um, another view from the northwest um, looking east. So being able to see a little bit of what those sort of perched wetland features look like um, leading down to the lake and the islands. Great, so that, those are our three initial schemes. Um, we've, uh, the survey that you're about to participate in is going to ask you different questions about what you like, what you, um, what might give you anxiety about some of them, um, if there's things we missed. Um, they all have, as, as we sort of showed, they all have different circulation strategies. They all have sort of different um, programmatic clusters and, uh, and, and sort of different um, landscape, um, way, ways of kind of connecting with the historical landscape and sort of landscape park narratives about um, what we're trying to accentuate. So we really uh, value your input um, and yeah, we just want to know what some of your initial thoughts are on our, on your, our three framework directions, um, what you like, what you don't like, as well as an understanding of what you think the first priorities should be. So most of the, these questions should all uh, be pretty clear in the survey. There's, there's places for you to write in answers if we miss something. And um, 
And lastly, we, we also just want to reiterate, you know, we're looking to connect with as many community members as possible. Um, so, um, you know, your help in reaching members who may not be here today would, would, would be really fantastic for us. Um, project schedule wise, we will see you, we plan to see you all again in, in September. Um, you can reach out and contact our team, um, you know, so first through this meeting interface, uh, but we really look forward to your feedback. And uh, that is all we have for you today. So thank you so much.